Listen, Mike, uh, we were talking downstairs beforehand, kind of catching up after 21 years. And uh, as I'm telling the group here so they know what we talked about, that 21 years ago I got the phone call after a tough time in your life. You've been viewed by so many people and got frustrated and had the Hollyfield incident and uh, found yourself in a place where, you know, they were waiting for your next fight, and they said, you got to help him so he doesn't bite that guy's ear off. That oh, was the way man, they said that to me. that was bad times back then, remember? <laughs> And I remember I came to come see you, and you were in, I think you were in Arizona at the time. Yes, it was. And uh, I came in, and I, I said, I don't want to come unless he really wants my help. I'm not pushing shit on somebody, right? I got in, you're like, hey, T, what are you doing here? <laughs> and we ended up having this conversation that for 21 years, when people have asked me in the media, look, you've been with every major president, you've been with Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela, who impressed you the most? Who blew you away the most? And they're always blown away by answer because for 21 years I've told them it's Mike Tyson. And I told them because you were quoting Nietzsche and, you know, Gil Gibran and the Koran. And, and, like, I couldn't believe how well-read you were. I couldn't believe what a love you were. And I also couldn't believe the amount of pain that I felt in you, brother. People think when you succeed, especially if you're generous as you are, that, you know, the world's your oyster. Well, it is and it's not. And so I, I asked you to come because... So many people in this room have succeeded on a huge scale. Mm. We have some people that are on their way to that. And they don't fucking know what it really means to not be fulfilled. And I always say success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. So I'd like to go back if it's okay. Go for it. And a little bit of history first. We share with people what you came from. And most people know some of the history, but like I know your mom died at 16. I know you had trouble with the law at a young age. Mm. Take us to how where life was like and what happened when Customato entered your life. Well, from what I can remember from the day I was born, it was always hard times, welfare, not much food, no money, crime infesting neighborhoods, murders, um, pimps, prostitutes, um, drugs, and um, it was um, survival of the fittest. And um, I had an older brother who was five years older than me, so he didn't spend much time around the house. He was in the prog programs. He was, um, he was very smart and intelligent. He was the special kid on the block that was always in school. And um, me and my sister got caught up in the street life. So um, I was bullied a lot as a kid. I used to have pigeons, and at one particular time, some bully grabbed one of my pigeons and ripped his head off, and that was the first time I ever got into a fight. And I, and I kind of like won. I was young, like nine, but I kind of like won. And um, so I like fighting ever since because it gave me attention. People would say, hey, you was that guy that beat that big kid up. You was that guy. And that was like, everybody knew me from that, in that incident. And so after that, older kids would bring other kids from different neighborhoods around my neighborhood, and they would pay us to fight each other. And that's how I started fighting. I probably had, wow, in my life, I probably had 400 fights. How many? 400. Wow. Well, in your professional career, you no, had like no, no. 50. No, 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 that's 50. Yeah, that's like 50 or 60. Yeah. And the street, that had about 400. Wow. And, then, and you were in trouble with the law, I know, early yeah. in the stage, right? And when did you get introduced to drugs? Oh, I've been drugs since I was nine years old. Wow. What kind of drugs yeah. back then? Cocaine, marijuana, nine alcohol, liquor. Because when I was younger, you know, my mother, who wasn't educated on drugs and alcohol, I'd say, even though she'd been in college, in order to perhaps get me to go to sleep, I was making a lot of noise, she would give me alcohol. Wow. Thinking I would go to sleep, you know? Yeah. At that time. And so... um. I started getting into a lot of trouble. By the time I was 12, I was arrested probably 40 times. Yeah. Everybody in the juvenile and the police um, department knew my name. Everybody, I was, you know, the regular. And so eventually I, they sent me away, and I was in this place. They sent me there for two years. And so I'm there, and um, eventually I get shipped away to another reformatory upstate New York. And I meet this gentleman named Bobby Stewart, who's a former professional fighter. Not a big-time fighter, but just a former professional fighter. Four 10-round fights, never big time. And he, every weekend he started, um, he would box with the kids. And then one, uh, one um, particular day he boxed me and he beat the shit out of me. But I took the beat and he hit me in the stomach. I fell down, I got back up, but he kept beating the shit out of me. But I took it and he thought that was um, a badge of courage. And so he, he, he started boxing me, started teaching me how to box. And then um, eventually I was, what, 13 then, I became too good. So he had said, I have to take you somewhere else for someone that could take you to the next level. And so I went and I met Customato. And uh, meeting him with... Uh, Did had, you know who he was? Not, like had he no idea. Flight I had no, no, had no idea about boxes. Wow. I was just doing this stuff. And I boxed with Bobby. And um, Bobby really had... He really... He, he like bloody my nose. He beat me up 
really bad that particular time because I was really putting it on trying to impress Cuss. And Cuss said, this is the next champion, providing he doesn't um, lose interest. So he said, how old he was? And I said, it, um, he's 13. And then Cuss said, he's lying. He doesn't want to go to prison with the grown adults, so he said he was 13. <laughs> wow. And um, so Bobby Stewart, because everything Cuss says is the Bible. And so he said, tell me the truth. After all these years, I've been there two years with him, and I said, tell me the truth. How old are you? I said, I'm 13. I'm 13. He says, tell me the truth. I said, I'm 13. So he got my birth certificate. He found out I was 13. And then cussing those guys just for the magnet. I didn't even agree to it. They said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be heavyweight champ. You're going to win the Olympics. You're going to win the gold medal. You're going to do this. And you're going to become heavyweight champ. You're going to be this and that. And I didn't want him to think I was afraid. And um, one day I had a couple of amateur fights, and I'm fighting. I'm 15 now. I had a couple of championships. And we're watching. Um, wow. Excuse me, but uh, we're okay. watching. Um, <laughs> that word goes around here easily. <laughs> we watch, we're watching Ali fight Larry Holmes. Oh yeah. And it, was it when Holmes beat him? Yeah. Beat Ali. It was really bad. Yeah. Excuse me if I cry. It's, um, it's really bad, real bad. So, God. Oh man, I can't believe I'm doing this. Thank you for sharing it, brother. Are you ready? The face and hand of the throne in this man. After he beat up Ali, that was his goal. And he taught me to become the greatest fighter in the world. I'm sorry, I can't talk. Oh, it's beautiful, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, brother. I just don't know where it came from. I just don't know how I made this old man. He made me this fight. He made you into I'm, this. I still don't understand that to this day. Don't Who is he? Where did he come from? What his life was like? It's yeah. But he loved you. Yeah. And at one point he even adopted you, didn't he? Yeah, when I was 16 when my mother died. Yeah. My mother died of cancer. Yeah. And so he adopted you. And he was your mother, your father, your mother. Oh, my psychiatrist, yeah. My therapist, he was everything, yeah. <laughs> And he taught you to fight like nobody else, but you even went, I, I already had you hypnotized at times. Tell me about that. Yeah, no, what was he hypnotizing you to do? He was a hypnotist as well, and he believed that, um, that he could reach the subconscious. On only, but only special people can that happen to it. It can't reach anybody. You have to believe in it because it's something that's very complex to believe in. I'm not going to believe somebody's going to tell me something and this is going to appear. So it's hard for people to even really believe this can exist. But um, I believed everything Cus told me. Everything he told me, I believed it. Yes. And so um, that's what it was like. Let many, I'm going to jump for a moment. We're going to come back to this time. But okay. Because you mentioned something. I'll give you a little breather here. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. They're trying to talk about thank I, I, you. I give a head for starters here. Right? Thank you. Thank you for your vulnerability, brother. It's real. It's fucking real. That's what everybody's looking for is real. We live in a world where everything's bullshit. Everybody's putting the polish on it and making their yeah. Instagram look good. This is real shit. So you watched Ali, one of the greatest men in history, right, before you. Yeah. And he gets his ass beat. And Larry Holmes was not nice about it. Not at all. He was, he was ego, man. Not at all. He was in his face. And I know you remember when you had the fight where you're fighting Larry Holmes and Muhammad Ali did the introduction. What did he tell you? They get him for me. <laughs> and what happened? I got him. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty awesome. So let me break back to Cus. So you're, he's training you. He's pitching this. At what point did you start to believe this? At what point did you start when to believe? I was 14. That's when you started to believe you could do it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you started winning, and then he dies. It's almost like a Rocky story, man. Yeah, like, he dies. He dies when you're how old? What, I'm 19. Yeah. And then you become the youngest tableweight champion in the world a year later. Yes, I did. And what was your mission when you were going out there? Like, when he died, what, what did it do to you, and, and how did you use it? Wow, well, oh, man, um, in all due respect, this is just, um, my, my mission was just to destroy everyone. Yes. Yeah. But you did it because you loved him and you wanted to make him proud. Am and I right or wrong about that? Yeah. Yeah, that was so much, yeah. how much but you love you. Know, um, that's true, but I really, as, as I got older in life, I, I really saw, I, I had to deal with demons with that. I yeah. felt I was that kind of person that really my objective was just to hurt people as much as possible. Yeah. You know, not just beat them, but just to really hurt them. Yeah. But they never forgive me. And that was just my goal. That's what I learned from Cuss. That's all I knew. Yeah. And he didn't have much time to teach me because he died shortly. He only had seven yeah. to six years to be, you know what I mean, to teach me anything. So what he had to teach me was fighting. Yeah. He turned you out. I remember when we met 21 years ago, you said he turned me out and turned the lights on. 
and how to yeah. turn the lights off, but not really how to turn off that emotion, how to do it in the ring. Exactly. How to not, like when somebody's hurting you, not to feel it, not to sense it, not to get scared. And you told me after the Hollyfield, you told me that the reason I lost that fight is because I got pissed. You said, I never get pissed in the ring. Exactly. Tell, tell me about that. You know, I lost discipline. Normally, I'm a disciplined fighter. I normally beat people I deal with under pressure. But for that particular incident, I just lost it that day. I was yeah. getting headbutt. I was frustrated. I felt I was in them being listened to or heard, and I felt nominism. And I just lost my temper, and I just didn't care When he anymore. headbutted you, you felt yeah. it was unfair, and they didn't do anything about it, right? Yeah. And you just lost it, and that made the difference. When we were together, you said something I'll never forget. Here you're quoting all the stuff, and you were telling me about your prison time, and you're saying to me, man, the only place people are equals in prison. And I remember I talked about the warden mm -hmm. talked about it afterwards and said that when you came there, like you know, there's there's the whites, there's the blacks, there's the Mexicans, all these divisions based on race. And you came in and said, man, what are we doing fighting each other, man? Like you said, we're all nobody gives a shit about us. We're the only ones who care about each other. When I was and you there, there was never any fights. Tell them about that. Tell yeah, them when about I was there, there was never no race problems, never no fights. How'd you pull Never. that off? You convinced hey, them what? Hey, listen, I used to convince everybody that we're all brothers, we're here together, we're doing this time, and no one cares. People were dying in there. People don't care we're dying. No one's coming here to give you a, a rim and say, I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. But this, this love that was in you, in spite of what you were trained to become, they trained you to be a beast, but they couldn't take away your heart. They couldn't take you know, away your love. Uh, that was just time. It was just time for me to heal. Yeah. You know, I was bitter and I took it out on other people. I took it out on myself and I, I didn't know how to deal with any adversity at that, at that degree at that, yeah. at that particular time of my life. Well, you told me, I remember you told me you, you were describing one of the first time you saw one of these. I don't know why. You told me it was a Sally Jesse Raphael show. I, I remember it vividly. And you were describing this Aryan brother, this big motherfucker, you said, and he had kill, you know, ends on the front of it, the N word, right? And you said to me something so insightful, even though you were in so much pain, I never forgot it. You said, you know what, Tony? He said, those guys want power because they don't have love. How did you figure that shit out? Well, you know, I, you know, because I'm one of those guys. You know, I never experienced love. My love was hurting people. Yeah. The more people I hurt, the more love I receive. Yeah. And um, I just was a time in my life I grew up and I, and I and lived that life and I received love. And I saw um, what love done when, once I became involved with my wife and we started having kids. And even though I had children before, I'd never been in a relationship when I was totally... Um, dedicated to, just like I wasn't fighting to be the best fighter I could, I wanted to be the best father and the best husband I could totally become. Yes. Yeah, that's my life basically now, my kids and my wife and my organization and my partners. Yes. My, my, my friend Rob Hickman's right there. Who, you know, Rob is shy, but he has to understand, you know what I mean? He put life in people's lives and make, give people hopes and um, that's what people need. People need to believe there's, a, there's hope for a better life out yeah. there. And that, that there were stages, where, there were stages where you didn't think that was possible. I remember I'm sitting with you and you're talking about love and everything else and you're talking about this process and at one point you're quoting all this stuff from the Quran and the Bible. I'm like, this man's one of the most well-read human beings I've ever met. And then you turned and said, sometimes, Tony, though, I get so mad. If there's a button, I kill every motherfucker on the planet. I push yes, it in the fucking heart. Yes, yes. Like you had, you, and you yes. talked about there's a lot of people that act good, but they're not good inside. And you were telling me about Tupac at that time. You said, Tupac doesn't behave good, but he's fucking good. 100%. Right? What's the difference? Tell people the difference about what you notice about the contradictions in human beings. And, well, let me say about myself. You yeah. know, what I've experienced, because I can only speak on myself. My whole life uh, lived with all of my ego. Just I was, a, I, was, a, I, was a, I had a, I was a megalomaniac with a low self-esteem. You know, um, if you if you said something, if, you know, if you said something, I always say I'm nobody, I'm nobody. But if you, but if it's something I want to accomplish, I'm the greatest. I'm a god. I could, could accomplish something. But as far as my perspective on myself, I'm shit. Yeah. Look at the life I come from. Even though I'm making all the money in the world, but look at me, my mother, my father, they are sex workers. What the fuck am I? Who am I? I'm a piece of shit. But I'm the highest paid athlete in the world. I'm the baddest man so called on the planet. But that's the low self esteem that um, I guess that I received. So I guess that's what cuts worked on my ego. My ego is out of this world. I, you saw, I, thought people had to, I thought people should carry me. I shouldn't walk. It was just, but that's all I had to succeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the day I met you, you just made uh, like 30 million bucks in that fight. Yeah. And yet I saw how miserable you were because there wasn't love. You had, you had a little family around you, your trainer, your church, they really cared about you. But you've gone through so many people took advantage. How'd you get through that, man? How'd you get through being able to trust people? Because you weren't able to trust anybody for, for good reason. Hey, because I couldn't trust myself. I had to um, be able to trust myself. Mm. 
You know, I had to learn to love myself. I had to learn to How'd respect you do myself. That? All those years? How'd you know, you're get... dealing with all, just dealing with the pain. It took, a, you know, it took like what's this lady Clinton had said. It took a village. No one person yeah. could do it. I had help from people who are no longer here anymore. Yeah. And it was a, um, a science project. Trust me. <laughs> science project. That's awesome. And so you become the youngest heavyweight champion in the history of the world at 20 years old. And all of a sudden, you're the most famous athlete on earth. I mean, you went to Japan. Remember in Japan? It was yes. insane. Tell me about, like, how do you deal with that when no one's prepared? No one understands what fame does to somebody. What They think fame is this beautiful thing, and it is, but then it comes with a price. Tell us about the price. What did you experience? What was the joy of it? What was the price of it? And one, at one stage, I was a god, but I just didn't know what to do. I was on the clouds, but I just didn't know what to do. I was there, and yeah. I just... Um, I got um, sucked into all my vices, women, drinking, parties, spending, and um, it just took a toll on me. It took yeah. a toll on my self-esteem, took a toll on my, my whole barometer, so to speak. Yeah. You, uh, you made a half a billion dollars playing, doing 58 fights. You won 50 of them, 44 by knockout. I mean, nobody sees that anymore. People watch the UFC because most people are bored with boxing because mm -hmm. even the great boxers, they're sure good, you just go, went at it. What is it, you know, at the end of that, what do you do to be able to find a new meaning for your life when you've been trained to be this way? I mean, people are pissed at you because you acted like a beast, but they trained you to be a beast. Like, yeah. how did you make the transition, man? I'm trying to um, make some sense out of um, my relationships with individuals and um, eventually, like, with my, my wife, let her understand this is going to be hell. You know what I mean? And she, she um, it appears that she can understand what I'm talking because she's probably experienced some tough cases of relationship. But when she figures out this is really hell, <laughs> you know, um, I'm just really, um, well, I can't even define the word. I'm just really, um, gratitude is the word I'm looking for. I'm really yeah. grateful that she stuck in with me. And we have the relationship that we did. We went through hell to receive it, but I'm just so happy that she stuck with me. Nobody would never stuck with me. Listen, um... Let me tell you a quick story. One day, um, I have to go to my probation officer to do my drug test, right? No, she had to go to her probation officer to take a drug test. I, I'm doing cocaine. I kiss my wife. The cocaine goes into her system. She goes to a doctor, takes a test, and the cocaine's in her system. Wow. And she called me and said, you motherfucker, I'm going to kill you. They're going to take my kid away. I get, I don't even, I'm so scared, I just get out of the house and leave. I have no car, I'm, just, I'm walking 10 miles, I'm just get out and leave. So I said, Mike Tyson, what are you doing walking? I said, please, give me a ride. I got in the car and they took me where I had to go. But I was so afraid, I didn't, know, I didn't want to deal with that pressure, what I had to deal with, and um, I just left the house. I, in my mind, I said, well, she's going to get up, and she, everything's good. Well, it can't be bad. Everybody's happy, I did cocaine, so everybody's still happy. I kiss her, it gets in the system, and when she tells me that, I'm saying, oh, I feel like dying. I just ran. I, I didn't want to face her, I couldn't do it. I thought, oh, I'm such a bum. There's some famous moments for you that's uh, become somewhat infamous. Tell us about how the hell you end up with, a, with tigers. Pigeons, tell us about pigeons, and then tell us about tigers. How the hell you end up well, with tigers? I've you always, I've in your underwear holding a tiger by a I've chain. always had pigeons my whole life since I was eight, nine years old. That's just what we do in Brooklyn, New York. We fly pigeons. I don't know why, but that's just what we do. And, and what um, do pigeons mean to you at that stage of your life, brother? That was our freedom. That was our... That was our ego. That was everything. You had the best pigeons in the neighborhood. And people would come from other neighborhoods and say, who flies up there? And I mean, who birds up there flying up there? And you would tell them, and you could see a bird flying from way over your neighbor. And said, that's the guy to fly over there. And that was popular in our neighborhood. That was, having wow. great birds gave you respect wow. and stuff. When I was a little kid, I wanted to have respect like the big guys had and stuff. But I didn't realize you had to be big to get the respect. And what about tigers? How do you have with tigers? Listen, this is really funny. So I'm in prison. I'm talking to my car dealer. And my car dealer is talking about some friend of mine that bought cars from him but never paid him all the money. So he said, Michael, so if they don't pay me all my money for the car, I'm going to trade their car in and get some animals like horses and stuff. I said, what? You could buy horses? He said, yeah, I know a guy that sells horses, tigers, cougars, penguins, all kind of animals, <laughs> right? And I said, really? What? He said, wouldn't that be cool, Mike, if you had your, one of your Ferraris and you had your tiger in you? I said, that would be very cool. <laughs> and so I said, um, <coughs> I, I explained, I said, well, why don't you tell um, the dealer to send me a couple of uh, cubs, right? And so I'm at my house in Ohio, and my wife at the time is 19, but she came to visit me, right? And she came to visit me. As soon as she came to visit me, the Cubs came that day. Boom. And she was there when we were playing with the Cubs. That's the first time I ever interacted with Cubs. I had no experience with Cubs. I didn't know they're capable of killing you at a certain particular time in their life. And um, 
I worked out. It was lucky for me. My cat, I had him for 14, 15 years. They never killed me. I heard tried to That's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> they must have sensed the love in you, brother. Oh, that's, oh, that's what I had to give them was love. Yeah. And then, so you even took a wild animals and your love made them love you. Yeah, but they, ate, they bit other people, though, but they just never bit me. <laughs> they bit other people, you know. So tell me something. Why do you think Customato was put in your life? I mean, this guy was a legend. He worked with the greatest of all time. You look back on it now and you look at your life. Because one of the things that's beautiful about you today, brother, is you have a different level of self-awareness. Like most people are like still locked into their own head. They're locked in their own mind. They're locked in their own ego. You, and, you know, people come up wanting pictures from you, doing things, and you were ready to fight him in the early days. Yes. Like so, what, what? What do you think he was in your life? And tell me a little bit about what life is like now. Hey, I, I, it's, it's very difficult to say because this guy's in my life, and he, we were two guys. He was isolated from. He was in exile. He lost all his mom, money. He was staying with his. Um, his sister-in-law, he couldn't marry, he wanted to marry her, but he couldn't marry her because he had tax problems and she would have to take on the tax problem so he could never marry her, he was sad about that. He was really a miserable guy. That took, and then with me up here, all he did was tell me dreams. He would tell me wonderful things, what we're going to accomplish and who we're going to beat and how we're going to help people and what we're going to do. And you're the greatest fighter God created. And, uh, he, said, he said you kept him alive. You know, we saw we showed a video before you came in. Him talking about your presence kept him alive. He said that there's a meaning in my life with Mike in my life. I don't know about that. It's just that uh, he put that fire in me. Yeah. You know, he had that tiny that He was tough and old and mean. Yeah. And um, he prepared that journey. And you learned how to use. Like you walk in the room, and the guys, you were five eleven, but you looked five ten because you're so square and powerful. The guy would be like 6'4", like your head was like <laughs> down here. Oh, man. And you walk in and scare the shit out of him. How'd you do that? And I then beat know. the shit out of him the first or second I was, round. I was the cuss. I wanted to strip them of their souls. Yeah. That's what he taught me. I know, you know, I'm not no philosopher. This is what I've heard from him. He taught me this is what you do to the big, strong men. And then it was for you, it was like, that's my job, right? Yeah. I'm paid for it. And you... You told me back then I learned how to turn it on, but I never turned, told no, you how to turn it off. No, I never did. I was, I wanted, the fights normally ended so quickly, I still wanted to fight after the fights. <laughs> you know, so I normally had fights after the fights. You know, somebody bum me, I punch a guy in the club. Or the, oh, man. That's so much adrenaline in your body. Yes. What's he going down in one, one, one round, right? A few minutes, a few seconds. What, I know it's painful to see you did that, but it wasn't, it wasn't what your soul was about. That's no. the beautiful part. I didn't have no perspective of myself. I just looked at my idol, Jack Dempsey, all these guys, Kid Jocelyn, and I watched what they did. I watched what they said. Sometimes I said things that are really crude. You know what I mean? That's, that's ironic sometimes. But I said because my hero said, they said in um, 1902. So it probably was, you know, they, yeah. by, the time, by the time they got it to the press in America, they had 100 fights since then. But right now, they ain't, with the way the world is, as soon as you say something, automatically it's around the world. So I would tell people that these guys are kids. I'm immortal. They can never beat me. How dare them challenge? And I would just say all these dreadful things. That's because I had low self-esteem. Yeah. I would always talk down about others. I'll kill you next time. Yeah. And it was just all because I was afraid of losing. Yeah. You said when you were interviewed back then in your 20s, you know, people asked you what your edge was. And I remember I was really touched because I, I live by the same philosophy. You said, my edge is my willingness to sacrifice. Tell us about that. Oh, absolutely. I'm, well, from custom model's perspective, I look at myself as nothing. I'm just pale, and I'm willing to do anything to myself to improve to be the best. I'm, usually, I'm willing to sacrifice my body. I'm usually willing to sacrifice my psychological health to just be the best in the world. And that's what really sacrifices. You really have to sacrifice your life, regardless if it's a marriage. Sometimes you have to sacrifice your life for a marriage or sacrifice your life for a goal you want to accomplish, and that's the goal that I, the rule that I've always taken, is to sacrifice and be objective. You used to say, though, that part of that sacrifice is you get up at 4 a.m. to run in the snow, and you told me back then, it's like, Tony, I do this because I know my opponent won't. Tell us exactly. a little bit, is that what true? It's all about sacrifice. I do what he's not willing to do. Yes. You know what I mean? If you fight, if you're rolling, running at two in the morning in the snow in the blizzard, I trust me, he's not going to want to do it. He's going to get on the treadmill. Yeah. You know? And you, you used to say that uh, when we had those urgent conversations, I remember you saying to me, Tony, fighting's easy. It's like, I prepare, I train so hard that the fight feels like, you know, it's, it's easy. Was that true? Exactly. Because you yeah. trained so damn hard. Exactly. It was, that's why I had a lot of one easy one round knockouts. Yeah. Pat Riley, you know, you know, was the Lakers, and he's a good friend of mine, now owns a piece of the heat. And he told me when he was a kid that 
one, his dad had a new role in black pick with him, but also a coach. And a coach one time was screwing off, and he said, you look in my eyes, bro. Mm -hmm. He said, your opponent, there's somebody out there practicing while you're relaxing. One day you'll meet him, he will end you. And it gave him this drive. That drive to have the edge, did that come before Costamato, or is that Costamato? No, well, customer told me different. He told me everybody's goals and dreams, and that their mother's sick of, or my goals are winning, I'll be a lie because you're a god. He told me one of the really crazy things about me, but the reality of it is, it was crazy, but I believed it. And when did you start, uh, like, as you got to this different stage of life, come out of prison, and all the field experience and things of that nature, when did you start to realize you weren't the god? Hey, um, I wasn't finished with God yet. I, thought, I really thought he was me. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> I got out of prison, so I'm really determined to be champion again because I'm going to show everybody this wasn't a fluke. I'm going to be champ again. They think this is over. I'm not going to ever come back out again. And they're laughing at me and making fun of me. So I'm going to come out and I'm going to win the title again and have more money than everybody. And that's what happened. But after I accomplished that goal, every day there was nothing else to do, so everything went downhill. Yeah, because remember after we worked together, you worked with that uh, tall white guy. I forgot the guy's name. What's his name? Uh, it was the one right after Hollyfield when you came back two years know, later. I forget. Yeah, I forget his name too. Yeah, I'm glad we forgot his name. It's just, what's it? White Buffalo. White Buffalo. Oh, Francois Bota. Yeah, because that's what we were preparing you for at yes, the time. And yeah. you wiped through, I think, like in the fifth round. Yes. But after that, it started to just drop shortly. You played, you fought some guys that weren't as good. Yeah. And then did, what did it do to your psychology when you didn't have that anymore? Like now this has been your whole identity and now you're not the God. Like, how did you deal with that? I mean, that whole, that guy had to die. That guy had to no longer exist in my life in order for me to survive in the new world. In the guy you were? Yeah. Yeah. No, I couldn't no longer, the guy from the past could no longer project anything kindly to my future. Yeah. So he had to die, and um, I had to be a different person. At what stage did you start to feel you were the person you really are in your soul, in your heart, the man you are today? When did, when did you start to really feel that? transition after that guy died. Was there a moment when you felt like that guy really died? Maybe. I had a four-year daughter that passed away, and that's pretty much what the change of my life and stuff. I didn't, I just didn't want to go out. No more. I, didn't want to, I just didn't want to do what I was doing at that particular time, but I still couldn't make the transition. I couldn't make the transition, and that's when I, um, things were getting out of hand, and that's when I met Rob Hickman, and he introduced me to this, um, this medicine called the toad. It has another scientific name. I don't know the name of 5 Five Yeah. And I, I, I've actually I've, done 5 email in Brazil. It was one of the most was, powerful experiences you know, in my this life. This is really interesting because when I was in your room, I believe it was downstairs, I saw a penal gland picture. And yes. I said, when I did the toad and I was under the consciousness of the toad, this is what I saw. Well, that's why it's there because I have the same experience. Yeah, really? <laughs> I, I could have figured that. I, said, this, I was telling Rob, I said, Rob, this is what I saw. I had such, I didn't help people with anything. Except I could never explain it, but I could see it. And I said, this is what I saw. That's why it's there. I, I have experience of, I've worked with millions of people, I could help them with any subject, but when it came to death, I just felt helpless, and I've never felt helpless to help people before. And I realized, because I didn't have my own resolution about death. How do you resolve that? You've never experienced it. And I think a lot of my drive came from want to make every moment last. Who knows when you're going to go? That was like my entire driving force. And then I met this man, Tony Bossis, some of the plots I met him, he's from New York University, and he was dealing with people that are cancer patients, who are, who are, you know, uh, terminal. And, and he said, Tony, he goes, you know, a drug is something you take over and over again to try to make yourself feel a certain way. He goes, this is not a drug. He says, this is an experience. He goes, you know, we do this double blind study. We take people to terminal cancer patients and we give them a placebo one time and we don't know, it's double blind. We don't know what they're giving them. And then we give them a real experience. And he goes, there's nobody. He goes, there was a woman here. He said, Tony, and he showed me a video of this woman. He goes, this woman, he said, she's not just an atheist. She's not like a California atheist, like maybe there's some God in the sky. She's a New York atheist. There is no God. You know, that kind of intensity. He goes, watch this video. And he shows this woman after she comes out of this experience. And she was forever changed. She said, I experienced God directly. I know there's God. I have no more fear. And so they've done all these studies. And so that's what brought me into it. It's like, I said, I went to Brazil. I want to have an experience where I don't have the fear of death. And if one experience can do that, so you had this one experience, and what did it do? What did you feel? What did you experience? Which well, um, first of all, I died. Yeah, you felt it. I died. Yeah, I, I, I died. Too. I couldn't come back, and I was saying, no, I don't want to die, because I got a wife and kids. I don't want to die. But it was saying, come on, the, the, the sound. When it first started I mean, happening, like we mentioned downstairs, no, the, I was like, stop this thing. I couldn't stop it. No. You know, I heard you had the same experience. So that's what I said. I don't want to do this no more. I wanted to stop. And the guy was like, it can't stop. <laughs> and um, scary as fuck in the beginning. 
Because you feel like you're dying. And I just started, um, I just told him every, I, I told this guy I didn't know, and I started telling him everything I did, everything I saw, all my things. I, I just gave him, I don't know, I was just telling him all my guilt. All the guilt just came out, I told him every, the real bad stuff, everything I did, and this is why I act this way and stuff. And um, when I was under it, I saw that, that penal gland. But the first time it hit me, boom, I said, I fucked up, I'm dying. I fucked up, why did I fuck up? I shouldn't have did this. this what did what it because I thought I was dead. Yeah. I thought it was over. I said, holy, why did I do this? And um, I was like, no, no, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And then it, at the end, it was like, yeah. <laughs> and um, I woke up. And it, 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 was, it only was 15 minutes, but it felt like three hours. And um, I've never felt the same in my life. I look at people. I even talk to people different since my experience with that. And... Um, the only thing I thought of when I came out, the only thing, the first word that came out was love. Yeah. I that's always you. what you've been, though, brother. Yeah. You were that first thing that came out said, I love you, to the guy. Really? That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I love you. That's beautiful. And what is it, what did it, what's it done for you since then? Like, how, what, what do you experience different about life? Hey, it, um, I just know I don't want to do what I did before. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want to strive and just, just live in a happy stress-free life. I got into this, um, my CBD and my cannabis corporation. This is just, man, it's just, it's been the best thing that ever happened to me in 25, 30 years. When did you make the transition? Like, you know, many people got to reconnect with you when they saw The Hangover, right? So how'd that come about? I heard you became friends with some of the cast. How did that affect your life? Listen, I didn't even know we were in the movie. I met the guys in the club. They were in the VIP section. And I said, this is where I normally sit. Nobody's normally here. So I went in there. I'm checking these guys. What are they doing in my section? There? It was Zach and um, the other guy. Yes. And, um, I was, and he said, hey, we're going to be in a movie with you. I said, yeah, when? He said, tomorrow. And I didn't know because I was drinking and smoking back then, doing drugs. So I didn't know I was involved with the movie. So eventually I had to go and we did the movie and it was success. And then one day I was in a restaurant. And the kids, the movie went out yet, but the kids must have seen a preview of it, me punching Zach. Yeah. And so one of those sightseeing buses went by, and all the kids came out the bus and grabbed him and take the pictures. And my friend said, I think we got something here, Mike. I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> and then it's been different. It's been changed ever since. The, the reason why when I, when I go out and I meet younger kids who are 20 or 15 is because they watched The Hangover and some of the other shows that yeah, that's what they had no experience. No idea that I used to be a boxer at any time. I heard Bradley Cooper and you became friends. Yeah, Bradley's a really good guy. He's a really good guy. Really isn't awesome it? guy. Really yeah. doing well too. And then how did the, how did your Broadway show come about? And some people don't know about it, but some went around the world. Tell us about that. And and it started out to be serious, and then your willingness to be humble and take the mix, so to speak, kid about yourself. That's... Tell us about that. Me and my wife are watching, um, we're going to see Chaz Parmentary, The Bronx Tale, the movie, but he's doing it on stage. And while we're doing the movie, um, during the, the theater play, I noticed 900 people arena and everything is quiet. You can hear a rat piss on cotton. It's just quiet. It's quiet. Some people are crying, but it's quiet. THC. And I tell my wife, I said, baby, I think I can do this. I want to make people feel the way this guy made me feel. And normally, I said, baby, normally when I'm in Europe, people, I'm on stage and people ask me questions and I'm doing Q&A. And next, I just won't do the Q&A. I do like a theatrical point of view like Mr. Um, Palmateri did. And so the first time we started, we did a six-week read. We did it. And so the first time we did it, we had all our friends join, you know, a thousand people that we know, or friends yeah. of people. You know, so yeah. they came, right? And we're nervous. So you're, 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 you're seating the audience to make it yes. go well. Yes. So I'm going out and I start my show. And I say something about, I didn't know my father. I didn't know that. Was, and everybody starts laughing. And I go back to, and I run back to my wife and say, baby, why are they laughing? What's going on? Is it okay? She said, baby, they're laughing. It's okay. Just keep going out. There. And I went out there. And it was meant to be like a real gritty New York tough guy that made it through all his hard adversity. But it came out to be a, a comic. Everybody laughed. They thought it was funny. And I'm talking about Were my... Were you pissed my, about that? Or yeah, I said, I'm talking about I don't have a father. I don't know who my father is. And everybody started laughing. And they start, you know, I mean, hysterically laughing. And I'm like, whoa. And that's not what I was... I wanted to be the card and tough. And it didn't turn out that way, so we made it into a comedy. But it, it didn't turn out... But you got so much more love by being, your, yeah. uh, being that soft I, part I noticed yourself. that. Yeah. And by doing that show, we went all over the country. Then we went all over the world and did it. We did it in 
stage where people didn't understand English. We had to do subtitles, and it was just um, exciting. And we're starting to do it again. Probably in six months, we're going to start. I'm training now. And so in a three-month period after finished training, we're going to start rehearsing again for the stage awesome. show. Do you ever think you're going to be an actor? No, never in a million years. <laughs> never in a million years. That's pretty wild. And now you got your, your documentary out that's out on Netflix and so forth. And how did yes. that come about? And how's that doing? Listen, it's doing great. We're doing part, we're getting ready to do part two. And it's something that my wife, she, she wrote the story. You know what wow. I mean? I told her about my life. I explained my life to her. And she wrote everything in her own canny way. And it turned out to be a hit. You told me back 21 years ago, you used to tell me the only reason I'm still alive is because of my kids. You have five kids now. Tell yeah. us about that. How six. Are... Six oh, now. Six now. Yeah. And um, most of them, I have one that graduated from NYU. She's going to be a um, director. I have one that's um, graduated from um, Georgetown. She graduated from... What's the what's the one? Um, um, she graduated from like seven colleges already. She's like a professional student. Okay, <laughs> that's all she does. She's in Arizona now. She's just a professional student. And um, I have one that's in American American University in D.C. And I have a 16 year old that's a homeschooler, and I have a 10 year old, and I have an eight year old that's homeschool. And tell us what's a day for Mike. Ty tell us about your cannabis business and what it means to you, and about the place you built. Tell us a little bit about that. Like, what's next for you? Well, listen, at this point, we embarked on this really um, amazing, state-of-the-art, first-of-its-kind cannabis ranch. And we're doing it in the Palm Spring hot desert area. And um, it's, come, it's pretty much off the 10, and we, have, we bought over, like, 420 acres. And one side is going to be for families. It's going to have um, best bet, or the top golf, and all that stuff, fun for yeah. run, for fun, and all that stuff. And then on the other side, we're going to have um, a stadium. Yes. So we have fights. We have concerts. We're going to have there. We're going to have a university. We're going to be able to educate people on cannabis and extraction of the, of the cannabis from the plants or the seeds. And then we're going to have a lake that's going to be like an acre-long um, running lake there. And it's going to be like a bunch of... Um, glamping. You're familiar with the glamping yeah, situation? Yeah. We have glamping. Glamping camping. Glamping camping. It's going to be like little... Um, it's going to be major, like chateaus. Wow. It's going to be like chateaus there. You know, Sanjay Gupta is a dear, Dr. Sanjay Gupta is a good friend of mine from CNN. Yes. And uh, he used to be so against cannabis. And now, you know, he's done all these specials on it to show how it can save lives, how it changes lives. Well, so listen, like, Did you ever think you'd be in the cannabis Never, business? but what you have to know from a, a medical perspective, um, from the, um, the Mental Wellness and Health in the Center, you know, it's, it's leaps and bounds. As far as um, the medical profession is concerned, it's made leaps and bounds. Especially those who've gone through brain seizures and things like that. Yes, it's, and it's, cancer. It's a godsend well. for the people of that nature. What's the day in the life of Mike Tyson look like today? How does it compare to the Mike Tyson? Man, listen, today Mike Tyson, the sky's the limits. You know, there's no, um, it's just no limit what I'm capable of doing, me and my family and everybody. We just, um, we just imagine going through tough times and adversity, if I would have gave up or did something ridiculous or got involved in fights with cops like I used to do and got shot or killed or something, I would have never realized this beautiful life because I was yeah. on that path and just uh, I, just, I surrendered and gave up I yeah. mean, and let God take his will. And I found my wife and we've been friends forever. And we're even more than being married, we're, we're friends and we're powerful together. Beautiful. You know? And you pray, I understand. I oh, absolutely. Well, I'm a Muslim. Of course I got to pray. You know, that's, that's what Muslims are all about, praying and That's stuff. right. And tell me, in a typical day, though, what does a typical day look like in your life today? Very different than before. Well, listen, it's just, like I say, everything is a very positive perspective. I accept my friends now. I never accepted my friends. In order to, um, to have friends, you have to be, be a friend yourself. I never yeah. allowed myself to be a friend with my friends. And those situations have changed. My wife, my children, we all had this, man, communal bond where we love each other, where it wasn't like that yeah. at first. And um, I, I couldn't be doing any better. You know, if I died, if I died today, I have to write a check because I was overpaid in life. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just really good stuff. You said one time that my flaws made me successful. And my flaws in the past, I think if you said something like I'm paraphrasing, have made me so grateful for my life today. What were the flaws and, and what's been healed? Well, you know, um, I have compassion, less compassionate for my fellow mankind. Yeah. You know, I have more compassion with him. I don't look at them. When I look at him now, I don't look at him as competition, of thinking of him being dead or hurt or something. It's all about love. You know what I mean? I yeah. think about loving him. I think about holding him. I think about helping him, making his life better, yeah. giving him a better point of view of life. 
have been a hope for life. If you, uh, you know, you've been through some of the toughest times, then it could be the highest highs, some of the lowest lows. What would you say to somebody who's going through a, the dark night of the soul and they don't know if they're going to make it? What would, what would be your advice to them? Because you've, you've seen it and you've got you to know, the other side. We have to understand we're stronger than we anticipate that we are. We're a lot stronger than we believe we are. And by um, believing in yourself, you know what I mean, you can overcome the most darkest moments. It's all about the belief you have in yourself, not about what other people believe in you. It's about what you believe in yourself and your intestinal fortitude, how much you could really take. You know, when I used to read about Nietzsche, I used to think the old man was a bad motherfucker. But you know why he was a bad motherfucker? But he took everybody's pain and he didn't fight back. Mm. That was the overman, man, the underman. The underman had to take everybody's shit and never fight back. I never understood that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. You know what I mean? I do, brother. That's the underman. That's the overman. That's the most powerful person who could take all the shit that you got to throw at him and not fight back. Yeah. And you have that power now. <laughs> You're living that power thank now. You, brother. Thank you, I love you, brother. I can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom with us. I know you're on a tight time when I get the plane. Let's have a hand for Mike Tyson. Thank you very much. Time.